Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, September 20th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Malware arriving in the form of ISO files isn't new, but sadly it's still spreading fast. Tom observed a significant uptick in the infections with the Chrome Loader malware, which initially arrives as an ISO file. Typically, uh, the user is confronted with the malware after clicking on a malicious search result. So that's where the author of the malware uses search engine optimization to make links to the malware rank high for specific popular keywords. After the ISO file is downloaded, the user will then launch the malware by clicking on a properties.bat file that is included in the ISO. Now, Tom is including more details in the diary, but the end effect is that the user ends up with a malicious browser extension that will, in its simplest form, inject malicious ads. But the real question that Tom is trying to answer, how do you prevent all of this from happening in the first place? In Windows, you're able to block automatic mounting of ISO files, either via group policies or uh, registry settings. Probably a good thing to configure this as uh, I do not see a lot of legitimate software that arrives as an ISO file unless it is actually, well, of course, a physical CD or DVD if anybody is still using that. One important exception I just want to point out, in some SANS classes, we use ISO files to store uh, the uh, virtual machines doesn't happen that much anymore, but I still think some uh, classes are doing it. It's a little bit of a throwback from the days when we actually had uh, DVDs uh, for uh, some of uh, these virtual machines. Also, Tom isn't the only one noticing the search in Chrome Loader attacks. Red Canary, Microsoft VMware, they all had similar warnings. For the most part, again, it just displays ads, but it's a browser extension. So it has access to everything your browser sends and receives. And there are cases of it being used, for example, to steal passwords. So basically becoming an info stealer. And sticking with evolving malware strains, sometimes it's nice to stand back a little bit and see sort of how they evolved over the years. Adva Intel has been looking at recent trends in the Emotet malware. Emotet is a downloader, started out a little bit as a banking trojan, but then sort of turned into a downloader in recent years. And well, as a downloader, its function is to deliver and execute and install a malware. But the type of malware that it delivered has sort of been changing over the years. Basically depends on who is paying for it uh, or what malware gives the best uh, install rates or profits uh, to whoever operates the Emotet uh, botnet. Brad has written about some of these different malware families that are installed by Emotet in the past. But like I said, this blog post by Adv Intel has sort of a nice overview of what happened and how uh, this sort of evolved. And one issue that uh, broke last week uh, but hasn't quite made it into this podcast so far is the Microsoft Teams issue in that Microsoft Teams stores uh, tokens in clear text on the local system. I wasn't quite sure uh, how severe uh, this issue is or how to consider uh, this issue. Just to be clear, what is stored is OAuth tokens, not usernames and passwords. So that's a little bit better in some ways, but in other ways it's also worse because that's the token that you get after completely authenticating, including passing any multi-factor authentication. So an attacker who is able to steal these OAuth tokens is able to authenticate without requiring a second factor. The other part here is that uh, apparently uh, this token, uh, the vulnerability here is in Teams, but the token is valid for all kinds of uh, Microsoft uh, features. So you may be able to use it for Skype or other uh, Microsoft uh, products. 
The problem here is in part that uh, the Microsoft Teams application is written using the Electron uh, framework. Electron, it's uh, popular. Uh, lots of other software like Slack and such is written uh, using Electron. And uh, the big sort of selling point of Electron is that it allows you to use web-based technologies like JavaScript and HTML to write native application. But the result then is that developers often sort of fall into these web patterns, even though they may not be really appropriate for a native application. Like in a web application, you would store an OAuth token as a cookie or uh, as JavaScript uh, storage. So it would be stored in the clear and you don't really have a lot of other options for a web application for a native application, you could then use some of the secure storage options that you have in your operating system. And in Electron, they are available. You just have to use it. There is, for example, the Kitar uh, package that's being uh, pointed out here as uh, one option uh, that you have. So I would consider it as a massive problem because an attacker first would need to have access to that token file, but uh, still something that Microsoft uh, should probably fix at some point. Until then, there isn't really too much that you can do about this as an end user. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.